Everyone in blockchain has heard of the name VeChain. VeChain completed its ICO nine months ago with a hard cap of 20 million. Currently, the project's market cap is around $2.2 billion. So in nine months, this project has more than 100x its original value and is still rising. And all of this was done in one of the worst market crashes that crypto has ever seen. The average crypto investor would think of VeChain as a supply chain project similar to Wabi or Walton Chain. With its VeChain mainnet coming up though, people are beginning to realize that VeChain will also be a blockchain platform. But few people really appreciate the extent of the technology behind VeChain and how game-changing it will be. VeChain will be specifically targeting corporate enterprises. So for example, Ethereum in comparison, Ethereum is the current biggest platform, but despite having hundreds of dApps already built on Ethereum, Ethereum does not have a single corporate enterprise building a dApp on it because it simply does not offer the features that enterprises need. But VeChain will do that. VeChain was also the first blockchain project to make a deal with the Chinese government. They are also the first blockchain project to create the first accredited cryptocurrency disaster recovery plan with the partnership of PricewaterCooper. So I hope that this information has whet your appetite enough to want to learn more about VeChain. And in the next few minutes, I will try to tell you everything you need to know about VeChain. <laughs> This is Sunny Lu. Sunny Lu is the CEO and founder of VeChain, and he was one of the co-founders of BitC as well. BitC was one of the earliest blockchain companies, and BitC has introduced other well-known projects like Quantum into the crypto space. Prior to founding BitC, Sunny Lu was working as the CIO of Louis Vuitton LV of China, and that particular role required him to have quite a strong awareness of both the technological aspects as well as the business aspect of a project. And the reason I'm introducing the CEO's history to you is because his balanced view of technology and business has also affected how VeChain was created in the most fundamental sense. Where most blockchain projects are focused solely on technological breakthroughs, example scalability and interoperability, to try and promote mass adoption of blockchain, VeChain has identified the hurdles to mass adoption as more than just the technology, but to include features such as the governments, the economic model and ecosystem, and the capacity of a project to comply with regulations and changes. The resulting product of this holistic approach is the VeChain Thor blockchain. Where Bitcoin was first generation blockchain, Ethereum was the second generation blockchain, and most platforms currently are third generation blockchain projects, VeChain sees itself as not a third generation project, but one that can evolve to a fourth, fifth, and more generations in needed. In other words, it sees itself as blockchain X. This is the governance structure of VeChain. The top of the food chain is actually the stakeholders with voting authority, and there's token holders like you and me. Now, not all token holders will have voting authority. Voting rights are dependent on two aspects. Firstly, the number of tokens you hold, and secondly, your role in the system. To have one basic vote, you need one million VAT tokens, and to play a specific role, such as to be a smart contract owner, you need a minimum of five million tokens for individuals and 15 million tokens for enterprises. To be an authority masternode, you need to own a minimum of 25 million tokens. Now, playing a more important role will allocate you with more voting authority, but holding more tokens doesn't give you more voting authority. Meaning that if you are a masternode holder and you already have a voting authority, even if you own 50 million tokens, you do not get double the votes of master or other masternode owners. The other significant member in the governance is what is known as the Board of Steering Committee. This is actually the main governing body and this is the main body that does the work. So they will be the ones who do the actual work of laying out the critical strategies and overseeing the operational units of the project. You will also notice that in the governance structure, they have what is known as the advisory board. The advisory board is literally that, it's just a board of advisors. It's a group of people who have diverse experience in various expertise to help and guide the project. Each member of the advisory board will be selected by the steering committee, and they are expected to be independent and not associated with any stakeholder. The number of advisors cannot exceed the number of steering committee members, and members of the advisory board will be compensated with a fixed amount of VAT tokens annually. 
All right, now let's take a look at the project technology. VChain, as you know, comprises of the VChain Foundation, which is also known as VChain Thor, which is the blockchain platform. And secondly, they also comprise of VChain Project, which is the supply chain project. Let's take a look at the blockchain first to see what makes them special as a platform. The first unique feature of the platform is their payment model. Now, usually payments on platforms are quite simple. You have an account, you buy cryptocurrency from an exchange, and then you use the cryptocurrency in that account to pay for any fees that you might incur. However, what sounds like a simple model isn't that simple for enterprises, because if you're an enterprise, you need stable fees. You need to work with stable fees. But cryptocurrency price, it has too much volatility. Furthermore, enterprises are not necessarily familiar or comfortable with the various tools that they need to use to manage the cryptocurrency. So VeChain solves this problem by utilizing a multi-layer payment model. And as you can see here, there is what is known as a sponsor's account balance, which is where the smart contracts will deduct the fee from if assigned so by the contract account. The contract account is the user. It is optional, they don't have to use a sponsor account if they don't want to, but it's really a feature that will help enterprises to manage the payment of multiple debts easily from a single master account, and it will also help enterprises to work better, or it will help the VeChain platform to work better with business partners who do not want to deal with crypto assets. This multi-layer model cannot be implied on a more traditional blockchain like Ethereum or Bitcoin because in those blockchains, the payment system is designed to end on a user's account only. VeChain's transaction model is also different or improved from traditional models in the following ways. The first is that it has a transaction ID. So in the traditional model like Ethereum, if a user sends out multiple transactions at the same time, all the whole batch of transactions are treated as one account nonce or a single batch of transactions. And if one single transaction was to fail in that whole batch, all the other transactions will also be rejected by the Ethereum nodes. So you can imagine how troublesome this would be for financial institutions. Now VeChain gives each transaction a unique ID and each transaction is then processed independently of each other by VeChain Thor. The next is their transaction dependency. And there are three aspects here which I will uh, explain in very simple terms. The first is depends on, the next is block wrap, and the third is expiration. Currently in Ethereum, only transactions that are sent by the same account can be, configured, can be configured in a specific order. So if I was to send transactions from different accounts, I cannot ensure that there is a specific order of transactions from the different accounts. So depend on is a feature that allows the sequence to be set across different accounts and it can do so because each transaction is not linked to the account per se, but each transaction has its own unique transaction ID. Block ref or block reference is basically more information from each block formation. So currently in blockchain, it's an open ledger and we can know the time of the transaction that of completion. So the time that the transaction was completed, but we cannot tell when the transaction was created. So block ref will allow us to see the full reference of every block before and after. So this is useful in financial cases where I need to delay the acceptance of a transaction. In other words, I can give you a proof that I have done the transaction, but you will only get the payment at the end of the month when it's due. So that delayed transaction, which is not available on other blockchains. Fuel expiration is simply expiring the transactions. So we all know the feeling of having our transactions stuck for hours or even days, and then we can't do anything because our cryptocurrency is stuck in the transaction. Expiration means that it expires the transactions and our funds will be returned to us. This actually makes the transaction a lot safer since it prevents hijacking and the reusing of funds. So there are people who specifically target funds that are locked in transaction and they hijack that funds or reuse that funds. Currently, when our transactions with Ethereum get stuck for days on end, we will have to set up a ridiculously high gas price to attract miners to pack the transaction into the next block. So when it gets stuck, you need to pay more people to clear up the mess. With VeChain Thor though, each transaction is allowed to have proof of work. So if the above scenario was to happen, if I send Ethereum and my Ethereum got stuck, the sender, which is me, has the choice to actually mine extra gas and do the computation myself. So I don't have to pay other people to do it. I can do a little bit of proof of work and sort it out by providing more computational power myself. So this 
increases the overall gas value for the transaction, but it doesn't mean that the sender myself has to pay more for the fault of the system. In fact, the sender, which is myself, actually earns a little bit by doing the proof of work myself. The next is known as a multitask transaction. So currently in blockchain, one transaction means one transaction. One transaction is one simple purpose of fulfilling just one transaction. Multitask transactions mean that you can make a single transaction do multiple tasks by making a single transaction comprised of multiple small transactions. The advantage of having this feature is that it will allow a great deal of power and flexibility to deal with very complex situations in real applications. So I have to say that just reviewing up to this point in the project, I really like it because when you look at the tech of the blockchain that they are trying to build, it's not designed to be just another blockchain technology, it's designed to be used by enterprises and uh, it's got the end goal of users in mind and I really like that. The consensus algorithm of the project will be proof of authority. So if you've been following our channel, by now you would have a very good understanding of the more popular consensus algorithms like proof of work, proof of stake, and DPoS. Proof of authority is slightly different. To run a node, each node user has to go through a KYC, which is know your customer, so to verify your identification. And then what they stake is not just tokens, but their actual reputation. The advantage of proof of authority is that it doesn't use a lot of computational power like proof of work and it doesn't need communications between masternodes to reach consensus because the individual masternodes reputation is at stake. So once you destroy your reputation, you can never be used by the system again. Furthermore, with proof of authority, it's very hard for masternodes to collude against the system because you're not really relying on the consensus between masternodes. So if the masternodes cannot collude, it means that the whole system then becomes very resistant to what is known as 51% attack, which other blockchains are more susceptible to. A 51% attack is basically an attack where people actually take over the majority of the nodes uh, and more than 50% of the nodes and then using their majority power, they can basically hijack the system. Another thing that makes them hard to hijack <clears throat> is the number of nodes that they have. The amount, number of master nodes they will have will be 101 master nodes. Okay? And that's quite a lot because if you compare it to EOS, which only has 21 block producers, or NEO, who only has 7 bookkeeping nodes, you can see how with the other projects where they use either proof of stake or something similar, and then they have a lot smaller number of nodes, it becomes a lot easier to launch a 51% attack on those projects. But it will be very, very hard to launch a 51% attack, if not impossible, on VChain Thor. The initial transaction speed for VChain Thor is expected to be 10,000 transactions per second already, okay? and that will make it one of the fastest in the market. And they are expected to include sidechains later on this year, which will make them even more scalable to even higher speeds. As a consumer, when we use blockchain products, we don't actually deal with the actual technology ourselves. We use apps on our phone, on our computers to access that technology. The app we use is the interface for our interaction with the blockchain. And APIs are the features of the app. So to define, give you an example of what is an API, uh, an Uber app will have features like GPS or payment features, and those features are known as APIs. So the actual process behind an API, as you can see from this diagram, can be quite complex. But what I want to point out to you from this very complicated diagram is what is known as horizontal uh, expansion. The actual process of horizontal expansion uh, involves very complicated technological stuff like consistent hash, IP hash, etc., which may be too technical to cover in this video for token investors. But the take home message I wanted to bring to you is that the API model for VChain is scalable, unlike a lot of other API models out there. And when we start talking about API, we are now moving into looking at the tech for the VChain supply chain project. Blockchain is a new technology. And every supply chain solution of blockchain will have to partner with another technology that is called the Internet of Things or IoT. Now, IoT is basically devices communicating with each other. So just like you and I can talk to each other, IoT or Internet of Things is devices talking to each other. So this is essential for supply chain where you want to track a product from factory to store. You want the sensors to be able to talk to the RFID chip, to be able to talk to the store um, hardware devices and more. 
Now, RFID chips are the chips that are, is located in every mobile phone nowadays. So every smartphone has an RFID chip and it's the technology that you use to do pay wave or tap payments. RFID chips are also the main Internet of Things hardware that is used in the supply chain um, currently. So VeChain has partnered with Jiangsu Printed Electronics, who was founded by China's father of global flexible electronics, a guy by the name of Professor Zhang Xiacheng, to help with the development of their hardware. Basically, Jiangsu Printed e Electronics has already collaborated with a Japanese company to produce a super high frequency RFID solution for temperature monitoring. So they have the most sensitive sensor in terms of monitoring a constant temperature in the transportation of food. So if you have to transport milk, etc., or um, raw fish, then the temperature of the, the transport has to be closely monitored. Also, while Jiangsu manufactures the RFID chip, VeChain themselves has manufactured their own NFC or RFID smart chip. In other words, this is basically an RFID chip that integrates blockchain technology into it. They are still working on extending the service life battery for the chips, which is where Jiangsu Printer Electronics are helping them with. So besides RFID chip, the VeChain project will also focus on creating other devices such as sensors, GPS, and more. So the Internet of Things is such an important um, part of the technology for VeChain that they have dedicated an entire branch of the technological team to researching Internet of Things um, devices. Hardware for supply, tracking, supply chain tracking is currently a very hot area in the blockchain space. Many other projects like Walton Chain, Ambrosis, Wabi, T-Food, etc. are all already producing their own hardware. At the moment, I don't think there is a clear leader yet. I think currently, Walton Chain may have the best RFID chip and Ambrosis probably has the best sensor. That's just my own personal impression from reviewing these companies. But each company is still in the process of developing their product, so we really have to wait and see who has the best final product. But this is definitely an area to keep your eye on if you are invested into any supply chain projects in the blockchain space. This is the technical roadmap of VeChain. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole thing with you. I just want to point out the main bits. And the main bits is that the roadmap began in 2015 and will end in the fourth quarter 2018 this year. When the beginning of 2015 means that the plan to launch the VeChain platform or VeChain Thor was something that was in the blueprint since the start. It's not an ad hoc idea that was thrown together in the last few months. Some people have the impression that VeChain was started as a supply chain project and then only recently they decided to branch out as a platform. That's not the case at all. In fact, it's the other way around. They were always meant to be a blockchain platform, but just happened that their first product, the supply chain product, was one of the uh, technologies that just seemed to take off and uh, found a lot of partnerships uh, and just seemed to take off before the actual platform was launched. But the main aim of VeChain was always to produce VeChain Thor, which is the platform. And if you read in terms of their technical roadmap, the, the end goal of the whole roadmap, which is in the fourth quarter of this year, the roadmap ends with these terms. It says it was designed to be a distributed business ecosystem formed on VeChain Thor blockchain. When I read this, I got very excited. And let me explain to you why. The end goal of VeChain is to be an ecosystem. Okay, An ecosystem is very much pr like projects out there like Neo and Icon, who are probably, to me, the most two outstanding platforms at the moment. VeChain is aiming to be the next big ecosystem. Now, let me explain to you the difference between an ecosystem and just a blockchain platform. Okay, There are many, many blockchain platforms out there. Now, there are so many blockchain platforms out there. How do you know which one to invest in? What makes a blockchain platform outstanding and valuable? I think that the platforms at the end of the day that will really stand out and give a lot of value to investors are not the generic platforms that you can build any sort of uh, depths on it. You know? The depths that are built on the generic platforms are not related to each other and they have no reason to communicate or work with each other. The platforms that will grow and give a lot of value are the platforms that have a very niche market. Okay, So for example, VeChain is not appealing to any kind of um, depths. It's only appealing to enterprises. So then all the depths that are built on them will all be enterprise related or relevant. And so all the products on it, all the depths that are put on the blockchain will be relevant to each other. So then they will interact with each other and that is what creates an ecosystem. 
that I think is the future of blockchain platforms. So I think that generic platforms, you know, won't have very much sustainability. Ethereum was an exception because Ethereum was the first player. But other than that, you know, I think now what you really want to look for to are protocols or blockchain platforms that have a niche um, client. And that is why I'm so excited because if you look at the VeChain um, angle, that is the angle of VeChain is to be an ecosystem. Now, what this means, okay, is that currently VeChain already has a market cap of over 2 billion and it's already number 16 on the rankings. But all that value of VeChain currently is only from the supply chain business, which is only one potential use case aspect of VeChain platform, okay? Um, the real potential of VeChain has not even begun yet. It has not even been unleashed yet. And the, the full potential of VeChain will only begin when the mainnet is launched and then you start to see dApps being built on the platform. Okay, over time, okay, it will become an ecosystem for enterprise dApps. And if you truly understand the potential of the VeChain project, it's so mind-blowing that the project is going to be so huge. You know, you can almost say that the VeChain project has not really started yet at the moment. Okay, let's take a quick look at the token economy. And I do apologize that this is quite a long review. Most projects have a white paper about 30 pages long, but VeChain's white papers was 114 pages long. So this is literally the biggest review that I've done. And there's so much to cover, but I, yet I think this is a project that is really worth doing one big good review because it's a project that I think every token investor should understand and be aware of even if they choose not to invest in it okay it's going to be so prominent in the market like ethereum or neo you just have to know what these projects are about okay so currently v chain tokens are called van tokens and van tokens are elc20 tokens on the ethereum platform but that will all change to vet tokens when the mainnet launches one VAN token will then be worth 100 VAT tokens, but actually the overall value is the same, meaning that one VAT token uh, will be worth 1% of a current VAN token. So basically the overall value that you have as a token investor does not change. The, the change or shift in decimal points was simply to make things easier for enterprise users to calculate uh, when they use payments and stuff. Now, at the same time that VAT tokens will be launched at mainnet, they will also launch a second currency that is called VTHO or Thor Power. Okay, Think of it like the relationship of NEO and GAS. So VAT tokens is like money that represents the monetary worth of the company and is also used for financial activities. Thor Power though is like electricity or energy and Thor Power is used to power the smart contracts and transactions. Now, it works like NEO and GAS, so you will get free Thor power for simply holding VAT tokens. It's a passive income and it's calculated on a daily basis, which is different from NEO, which is only calculated on a monthly basis. Unlike GAS though, the Thor tokens will have a stable value. So if you have been into NEO and GAS, you will know that GAS price has risen a lot over the last few months. But this also means that any transaction or anything that relies on gas on the NEO platform, like launching a dApp on the platform, will all cost a lot more as well. So to avoid this, the VeChain has designed Thor Power to have a steady value. And the way they do this is that the authority masternodes will have a decision-making power over how many Thor Power tokens they are and produce. So whilst there is no supply limit to the Thor Power tokens, um, they will control the rate at which it's being produced. So if they need, if the Thor Power tokens uh, start to have a, um, start to have too high a value, okay, they, all they need to do is to deflate the price by releasing more Thor Power tokens. Now, before you think this is a bad thing, it's not because the Thor Power tokens that you receive is based on the amount of VAT tokens that you hold. So if the um, if the Thor Power tokens drop in value, all this means is that as a token holder, you will receive more. Thor Power tokens. So for the token investor, it all works out well. This is the team. We've already covered the CEO, Sunny Lu, at the start, and he is really the man that is carrying the project. Their CFO is Jay Chang, who has previously worked at PwC and Deloitte as senior manager for over 14 years. Their COO is Kevin Fang, who has over 12 years of experience of consulting and assurance services in cybersecurity, privacy, and emerging technology at PwC. He's also currently driving the development of blockchain services of PwC in China and Hong Kong. And you can go through the rest of the team yourself, but this is a very solid team behind the project. 
One thing that I do want to mention about the team, which I really like, is that when you actually do a detailed research and you look into their white paper and you also look at the way they have been doing things historically, you get the feeling that this is a team with a lot of foresight. They don't rush the projects, they don't rush the products just to please the crowd. And their products at launch is always working well and solid. If you read their white paper, they have an entire section on testing. And also, their mainnet is due to be released at the end of June, right? But actually, the coding for the mainnet was already completed back in mid-April, so about two months ago. And they, were, they have since then been doing a lot of internal testing. And then a couple of weeks ago, they asked professional, um, different professional companies like PwC to come in and audit them. And now they're opening their code up for open testing by anyone three weeks before mainnet launch. So this is a very impressive kind of time frame in crypto space. Most of the time, projects are rushing to hit the deadlines, and more after, more often than not, you know, close to the mainnet launch or just before mainnet launch, you see that the the projects run into a lot of flaws with their technology, as what we saw happen with EOS just a few days ago. Next, we come to partnerships. The make and break of every blockchain project is their partnerships, because this is where you earn the money. VeChain has a lot of partnerships, as you can see, and the partnerships are not small players. The partnerships are impressive big names as well. The above list here is only a rough list of the partners, and I may be missing some. Some of the more notable partnerships they have include the Chinese government in the Juan New Area, and that is a social economic development project. Another partner they have is BMW. If you don't know who BMW is, go and shoot yourself. The next partner they have is PricewaterCooper which is one of the big four accounting firms in the world. Another one of their partners is DMVGL. And I'll explain this one a bit because not everyone may know who is DMVGL, but they are really one of the biggest partners. DMVGL is the world's largest classification society and they represent a global market share of 21%. Okay, so that's huge. Another of their partners or two partners is the China State Tobacco Monopoly Administration as well as the China National Tobacco Corporation. So China currently accounts for 40% of all cigarette use in the world. And these two bodies regulate all the cigarette use in China. In other words, VeChain has already partnered to be used by 40% of all the cigarettes smoked in the world. And if you're a tobacco company in another part of the world and you're looking for a supply chain product, why wouldn't you use VeChain when they are already have a technology that is working and running well? Another of their partners is um, Kune and Nago, who is the biggest global sea freight forwarder in the world and the second biggest air cargo. That company alone brings in an annual revenue of over $20 billion. They, another partner is Fang Huhuang Financial Services, who provide collateral bank loans to small and medium-sized enterprises. And recently, VeChain also partnered with Bright Foods and Shanghai Xiaodou Food. Shanghai Xiaodou Food is... Um, subsidiary of Bright Foods themselves, and they have already announced that they will integrate VeChain throughout their entire supply chain and data management system. So this is a combined revenue of more than 25.3 billion annually. And there are more, okay, these are just some of the more notable partnerships that I'm aware of. So it's very impressive. Coming towards the end, let's talk a little bit about price. So VeChain is currently sitting at $4.15 per token. And by the way, the website here says that it's a VAT token, but it's not a VAT token. It's still a VAT token for now. So this is an error, but just too enthusiastic. Now, at the peak in January, okay, uh, one VAT token was worth over $8.50 high. Okay, And currently, they are sitting like half of that price or less than half of that price. If you consider the fact that the market is now very down, so then the token is now at the low price point. If you consider the fact as well that their mainnet is just around the corner and their native wallet release is also just around the corner. And furthermore, with the attraction of passive income together with the free tall power tokens, just in the near future alone, meaning the next one to two months, the price point of this project is likely to soar. The long-term potential of the project is even more promising. Okay, you're talking about a platform that will host dApps for enterprises with an aim of building an ecosystem. And mainnet launch, they will already be one of the fastest platforms with the best governance and enterprise-friendly features. And we are still expecting even more news in terms of sidechain scalability later in the year. It's a great team behind the project. The team is very careful and very intentional about the way they proceed. 
they have great partnerships and they already have a great use case already. So what more could an investor ask for? My bullish prediction is that within the next year, VeChain will be a top 10 coin. So I'm very bullish on this coin. Before this review, I don't actually own any VeChain tokens, but now that I've taken a much closer look at the project, I will be personally taking a position soon, and I think I'll take it soon because once mainnet comes and if the market picks up, we may never see this kind of price point again. So that's it guys, that's my thoughts on VeChain. Let me know what you think of VeChain and any other interesting facts of VeChain that I've missed out so that the rest of the community members can read it in the comment sections below. I hope you found this video helpful. If you like this video, do give us that like and subscribe. We also have a Telegram group with great discussions and there is a link for donations below in the description box if you would like to support me to do these reviews full time. And again, thank you so much for joining us guys. This has been our biggest review. So really good job if you're stuck in there all the way. Have a great day wherever you are and I will catch up with you guys again very soon.